Hello, and welcome to a telephone call today. Uh, my name is David Durovi. I run the day-to-day -day operations of the Post Institute, and today we're uh, fortunate to have longtime therapist and guide for parents, uh, Brian Post. And hello, Brian. Hey, hey David. I, I just wanted to take a moment of your time or a little bit longer, Brian, to talk about some of the issues that seem to come in some of the questions that we receive either on our Facebook or people on the website emailing us and just due to the simple volume of questions and requests and, and need that is out there, it's almost impossible for us to respond on a case-by-case -case basis. So I thought, uh, particularly since we had gotten a couple of questions within just a day or so of each other on the topic of education, and having heard that you may be uh, in the near future working on a new book uh, dealing with uh, trauma and education, I thought perhaps we could talk a little bit about this just and see if we can share some tips both uh, maybe specifically to the two questioners and in general in the educational the realm. realm. Perfect. Let's do it. All right. So the first one, um, this one's uh, about a, a young child from Ethiopia. Let me just read it to you briefly. My daughter came home from Ethiopia at two years old five years ago. She's in the second grade still having significant emotional wounds that we continue to work on, such as trauma, out-of-control, emotional outbursts, etc., but only at home. But now our teacher is very concerned about her educational development. At home, it seems very hard for her to concentrate or focus on reading or math, and I don't want to hold her back a grade unless absolutely necessary, as I think the emotional toll would be enormous. Any advice or thoughts? You, you want so, to take these one at a time, Brian, or should I give both of them to you? Oh, no, no. Let's, let's just do them one at a time. If there's overlap, that's, that's fine. Okay. So let's, we're, we're assuming here that this child is seven years old. Um, if ever there is a time for a parent to hold a child back, it is now at this age. Um, it, it wouldn't, just speaking on the, on the subject of holding a child back, it's not a bad idea just in general because – with this child coming to this family at two years old, she's already emotionally arrested at some level. Um, you know, all we know is that she was adopted from Ethiopia too. We don't know really the circumstances, but we know just by nature of adoption, then there was some trauma and could be significant trauma. But um, hold, holding her back is not a bad idea just, just in general because it will give her an opportunity to come closer to lining up with children her own emotional age um, over time. So that you, there's, no, there's no detriment, um, no, negative, no negative effect that the parents need to worry about as far as that's concerned. So I would almost actually suggest that if, if uh, public school is going to be the, the preferred route of education for this child, I would – probably suggest just go ahead and hold her back and just get, take that right off the table. Now, number two thing that's really important in what you're just saying is that the parents have to make sure, and I would from the earliest, absolute earliest possible time, make sure that this child is operating and being educated under an IEP. That, that is essential just by nature of her history by nature of adoption is going to be able to, to easily justify an IEP for this child. You know, you're looking at potentially PTSD. If not, you're looking at generalized anxiety, you're looking at separation anxiety, you know, any, any number of potential things. And then all, you know, PTSD oftentimes surfaces as ADD. Um, people aren't aware of that, but a lot of times children who are diagnosed with um, ADD are actually uh, children who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And essentially what the ADD does is it is a reflection of a hypervigilant child, a child who's always on alert, whose amygdala is always on alarm, so she's always looking for a threat, therefore she can't concentrate, she can't focus, she always seems to be moving around, looking, you know, un unable to focus, unable to pay attention. So you want to make sure that as a parent, you want to make sure this gets communicated to the teacher and to the school at the very 
the very early, po- I mean, most possible stage. And nothing, nothing should happen. This, this child, uh, all, I'm, I'm hesitant to even say the child should be sent to school without an IEP because everyone's going to miss the boat. Everyone's going to be trying to teach this child in the same manner, and this child is not going to she – may, she may learn, you know, in the same manner if she's regulated, if she's calm, if, if she's not feeling overwhelmed. But by nature of, of the educational environment, school is, is overwhelming. So this child is going to naturally and automatically be at a deficit um, in the educational environment. So I'm hesitant to even want to send her to school without an IEP because no one, no one has any expressed understanding of what her needs are. So you send her into an environment where she's 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 not gonna she's gonna struggle, and and that's just with everything else that she's had to experience and encounter. I mean, you have to understand, adopted at two years of age, she's already made it through a significant stage of brain development. There's lots of lots of imprints that have occurred there, so there's no telling what some of her core experiences are in relationship to big environments of people, lots of stimulation. You know, on some levels, a school could actually be um, kind of model an, an orphanage at, at, at many levels. So she could, by all, by, all, by all means, be going to school, sitting down in a classroom and being triggered at a, at a core level, at a brainstem level, as though she's right back in an orphanage because of all the kids, because of the – the, the lack of caregivers, et cetera, which is going to trigger her anxiety and all that kind of business. So, you know, so those, those are two really important things. And then when I, what I say based on, based on what you're saying, um, you have to forgive me here, David, because I'm not, like, setting out a studio. I'm actually pulling some chicken off of, uh, off of uh, chicken that I made, and I am making chicken quesadillas for lunch. So just thought I would share that in case you hear some background noise. Um, well, thank you, you for like taking one. time out of your busy schedule there of uh, making lunch to uh, share with us today. <laughs> exactly. I was just going to say I can mail you a chicken quesadilla if you'd like. But, uh, all right, so the third thing is what the teacher said about being worried about her education. This is really, really important. The educational system – all of us on some levels, parents, teachers, what have you, we really miss the boat a lot of times when it comes to educating children who have, who have trauma history, especially adopted children, who are coming from orphanages, um, you know, and, and, and all these new experiences. Now, granted, this child has been with this family for five years, but this child, you know, it, that's, that's still not very much time when you come when you when you, when you measure that against the intensity of the child's experience since she has been in this world. So we get disproportionately concerned with education, quote unquote. And so. As, as we start to focus so much time on education, what we start to do is we start to neglect the child's emotional progress and development. And as we do that, we are setting the child up for later struggles. So you might say you might hold the child back um, a grade level, but if you're only holding the child back a grade level because you think that that's how they're going to be able to pick up academically, uh, therefore, you know, educationally and cognitively, then that's the, wrong, that's the wrong reason, actually, to be holding the child back. The reason to hold the child back, is first and foremost, is because they are so out of balance emotionally in most instances. So you have to think from the perspective of getting the child emotionally regulated in such an environment first, before going on and thinking about their their educational development. Now, you know, teachers don't want to hear that because they're there, you know, to provide education, but the bottom line is a dysregulated child is not going to be able to learn no matter how effective of a teacher you are because you have to get the child in a place of regulation before 
they can learn effectively. So thinking about it from that context, you know, the teacher, both, both the teacher and the parent need to need to worry less about what the child is gaining educationally. Back off, you know, focus first on making sure the child feels safe and, and secure in the environment, and then letting them learn at a pace that is congruent with their with their cognitive skills. So first work on the emotional and then let them learn at a pace that's congruent cognitively, educationally. And that may not be on a on a second grade level. That may actually be on a first grade level. That may be basic kindergarten. But the key is that you're actually teaching the child how to learn. So you, you're nurturing the child in their ability to learn at this very early age, but more than anything, you're helping the child to feel safe and secure in the educational environment. And as you help the child to feel safe and secure in the educational environment, and then you begin teaching them how to learn, then they grow up with a knowledge of not only feeling safe in an educational environment, but they grow up with a knowledge and an understanding of what it means to actually be able to learn. So spending, putting less emphasis on the, on the cognitive educational and more on the emotional. Um, at home, you know, if you can't feel distracted at home, where can you, where can you feel distracted? And I, I sense from the question the parent is really wanting to try to help the child pick up educationally at home, and then that way they can catch up, you know, with their classmates. And that's the, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong focus. The right focus at home is building relationships, creating love, you know, creating security, creating an environment of communication and understanding and openness, you know, and, and, and nurturing the child to be able to express the feelings and communicate effectively. That's the right environment in the home, you know, leave education for the educators. And so uh, I, I would encourage the parent to really focus less, less on trying to make something happen educationally for the child in the house and more on just helping the child to continue to feel safe and secure and, and free to communicate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know from our own experience and many people that I talk to, the experience of trying to do homework at home with these children is an invitation for uh, – confrontation that just becomes a horrible experience and parents get uh, even more disillusioned and the children I'm sure uh, feel the stress even more um, so anything that we can do as parents to help our kids do better at school even if it's not school at home uh, would probably be welcomed well I, you know and what happens what parents don't realize is they really do believe that they're, you know, they're trying to help their child out. They're trying to help their their child learn and, and develop and all that good stuff. All that chaos at home and all that stress and strain, what they're actually doing is jeopardizing the relationship. And you're jeopardizing the relationship for the wrong reason. You know, education, the school education is the wrong reason to jeopardize the relationship with your child. Um, quite simply because children are going to learn just, just by natural process of living. You know, we're talking about a, seven, a, a seven-year-old. It's just, it's just the wrong focus. You know, create the focus at home on security, and I'm, I'm always reminded of my, my good friend and, and co-author Nancy Clark with her daughter, Christina. You know, Nancy just finally told the school we are not doing homework at school. If it doesn't get, if it doesn't, we're not doing homework at home. If it doesn't get done at school, it's simply not going to get done. And that Nancy still says that was the best thing that she could have ever done for her relationship with her daughter, because it's just creating too much stress in the home environment. Yeah, that was exactly the route that we finally had to take. Was we're not doing schoolwork at home. Period. That's easy when you can get that put into the IEP. See, that's why the IEP is so important. You know, and, and parents don't realize that short of just having the most wonderful, open, supportive relationship with, with, your, with your child's school, 
Um, the IEP is the only thing that you have that you can that, that you're going to be able to rely on for getting what's in your child's best interest. It just it just is. There's there's nothing else you're going to be able to do. Right, Brian. We have a, a CD set uh, on the on the website called IEP and the Law. Yeah, I did that with Jim Matt Pruitt um, some years ago, but it's it's an excellent little educational educational set for parents, especially learning about IEPs. Yeah, would you think that's almost required listening to for uh, oh, parents? Ab- absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a that's a, the best way to state it. That is required listening, for sure. You know, the kind of the funny part about this all is our son is, uh, well, he's 19, he's going on 20, he's going to finish up high school uh, this spring, and he's never, he's never done poorly in school academically, but he's always done poorly in terms of behaviors. In fact, uh, he was yeah. at one point got expelled from two different schools on the same day for different, two different reasons. I mean, that's probably a record. Recently, it was interestingly enough, we had him tested, and his IQ fell in the top 8% of the adult population, and on two of the exams, he scored off the charts. The doctor said to me, I've never seen anybody get so high. In fact, we can't even score them because they're perfect, and the time relation doesn't even work on this. He said, it's just amazing to see somebody perform so well. And it didn't have wow. to do with him doing his assignments because he never did his assignments. He, right. You know, he was right. almost capable of doing them, still hates to write to this day. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. it's not like these children are, are going to fall behind necessarily. In fact, many of them may be so far ahead uh, that uh, this is really just a chance for them to get de-stressed in the process and thereby open up their own interests in pursuit of uh, what, they're, uh, what they're good at, where, where their talents and skills are, and forget about uh, some of the standard curriculums that might be out well, there. Well, and, and that you, you bring up another extremely valuable point there in, in understanding for, for parents, anyone raising a child, you have a history of trauma, and that is there's there's research that's been conducted that in many instances of experience of early trauma, especially instances of, of neglect, which I don't care how beautiful and lovely an orphanage is, there is neglect occurring for an infant. But there there's there's research been done, extensive research that basically says that children who've been neglected they learn. Their left hemisphere learns to compensate for what their right, their left hemisphere, which is the, the thinking, the rational brain, learns to compensate for what the the, the right hemisphere. Uh, I can't remember if I even just said that right. The left hemisphere is the thinking brain, the rational brain, learns to compensate for what the right hemisphere, the emotional brain, isn't getting. So, in in that regard, these children, in so many instances, actually operate on a level of genius in comparison to other children who haven't had these same experiences. The problem is that these children, oftentimes because of their emotional deficits, because of the, 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 the emotional difference between them and their peers, you never see it. You never, right. You're never able, to, you're never, never able to really recognize that this is a genius you're dealing with Instead, you just think it's some silly, immature kid who can't get their act together. Yeah, I guess the fact is we never give them a chance to show what they know. We just keep asking them if they know what we're trying to teach them. Exactly. That, that, that's very, very well stated. All right. You know, before we do question two, I remember that the, um, the word education comes from the Latin verb, if I remember correctly, educare, which means to draw forth or draw out of. It doesn't oh, mean nice. to draw things into. Nice, nice. I need to remember that. You yeah, and our to, uh, system seems to be more one of stuffing things into people instead of drawing out uh, uh, from yeah. them. You have to send that to me. Absolutely. All right, we'll do that. All right, number two, what do you recommend as a school setting for a traumatized child? 
My daughter is 10 years old, adopted at three from a Guatemalan orphanage, likely neglected, maybe abused. She's diagnosed with PTSD, RAD, ODD, and depression. Currently in the fourth grade in a classroom for children with behavior challenges. I love that. We put uh, we had our son in a classroom with behavior challenged, and he kept getting um, he kept getting suspended for behaviors in a, a behavior challenged class. I mean, what's the purpose of that? You don't, anyway, you don't she's doing terrible. On that one. <laughs> yeah, she's doing terrible. I've tried homeschooling her, and it worked for a while, but then she refused to do her work. This is probably what we've experienced as well as most parents have is we try the homeschooling we tried it three or four times before we gave it up finally do we just spend our days bonding and leave the schoolwork till later her social skills and ability to handle the stress of social situations is poor will she be further behind if we take her out of school her classroom is not a trauma sensitive classroom and is just she is just surviving I don't know my options what's the priority at her age her therapist says she needs regular social practice. She also says, I need a break. It just feels like we're sliding downhill. What do you recommend? Well, I'll tell you, I think that the, the, the mom nailed it because she's on the right track. She, her intuition is telling her that school is not the priority in this moment and that what her daughter needs is a stronger, more secure relationship with her and within the family and to feel more regulated. And, and I just got to say, you know, so many, so many therapists are half retarded, emotionally retarded themselves because they were put in social environments far too young and far too early, and we do that to our children all the time. And so the significance here is that the most important relationship starts in the home. And if this child is struggling just in the relationships in the home, then nothing else is going to be of value and benefit for her. Exposing her to social relationships with other children at her age is just going to set her up for having bad experiences because emotionally she's not there. She's not regulated enough to be able to benefit from what those relationships may have to offer. Eventually she will be able to but not right now. And so I think the parent is on the right track by, by realizing that what this child needs is her academic focus put on hold for a while. And it doesn't have to be forever. See, this is the thing. You could put that, you could put the academic focus in, oh, let's just say, what are you going to say putting it on hold? Put the emphasis of academics on hold. Okay? Stop Stop forcing the child to try try to have to try to have to accomplish academic things, and then work on the relationship, work on trust, work on security, work on communication, expression of feelings, and then slowly introduce academics by nature of reading to her, museums, activities that you can get involved with her in, you know. Um, Learning in, in a different way, pay attention and find out what, what her learning style is. You know, she may have a different learning style, how she may learn um, to be different. So, so thinking about education in a different way as opposed to how we typically view it. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that parents have when it comes to homeschool is they think Homeschool means bringing school into your home, and you have to put your child on the 9 to 3, and you have to give them recess, and you have to give them breaks and all this business, and, and they have to learn their, their reading, their writing, and their arithmetic, and they have to do assignments one hour at a time. That's not what homeschooling means. The, the average amount of education a child, any child gets in public school is two hours, and I think that's a stretch to think that a child actually even gets two hours. So... If you can get two hours of quality education in one day, and I'd say even, even an hour, and I'd say even, even before you go to an hour, start with 30 minutes. You get 30 minutes of quality education in a one day, you're, you're ahead of the curve. Okay, and then just build up from there, but make the relationship the most important thing. You know, stop putting the academic focus, in, and for sure don't worry about the peer stuff. I mean, that is, that is so overrated as far as I'm concerned. 
Um, we, we make all kinds of mistakes with our children by trying to get them to focus on the pure stuff. And get her out of that thing, behavioral classroom, just as soon as you can be. It's one of the funny things that Bruce Perry always talks about is how do you put, you know, how do you put a group of children who need social skills, social skills development, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a class that all of the children have poor social skills? So how are, are they actually supposed to learn social skills? When all the other kids have poor social skills, well, behavior behavior classrooms are the same way. You, you know, it, it's just not going to be effective. It's going to foster more negative behavior than it is positive behavior. You know, if you want you want your child to be around other kids and learn from them, get get her one on one with a really regulated child, maybe a child who's a little bit older than her and a little bit more tolerant and a little bit more patient. You know, maybe even get a junior high. A junior high student um, who could come by, oh, come over and mentor her and and kind of relate to her, but always keep always keep peer interaction one to one in those instances with children who have emotional challenges, as opposed to in the in groups, because even even a group of three is overwhelming for this child. So, I, I think the I think the mother is is on track here with what what her daughter needs. Um, she just needs to realize that it's okay, and um, it'll work out. But so, I mean, what do you do? She's in school right now. She's 10 years old. Do you just pull her out of school? Sure, why not? Just I don't know. Pull her out. Seems... Yeah, pull, yep, absolutely. Pull her out and put her on the, put her, get her in a homeschool protocol. At least she'll, you know, she'll be whatever the, 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 the laws of the state are. Um you know, get her get her in a homeschool protocol, and then just go at her own pace. And it's just not that important. Yeah, I guess especially if if you've tried it already, which she has. Um, I know when we started homeschooling, we we tried to plug into all the typical homeschooling programs out there, of which none of them really are intended for children from hard places. So we had to do a lot of homework to start changing our approach so that it fit our child rather than f- have our child fit the curriculum. But I know some of those things are out there where you can you can be a lot more flexible uh, with your homeschooling and uh, almost make it uh, somewhat of a joy for kids. Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. And, and then the parent can give themselves permission to take a break whenever they need to. Okay, yeah. take a break whenever you need to. Send your child out to play. Put your child in front of a TV or on their computer or whatever you need to do so that you can get a break. You know, that's use, use that's my feeling about TV and computers and games and all that stuff. Use them for what they are valuable for as artificial babysitters. And then you can take your break whenever you need to take your break. And then it will probably be good to at least try to team up with one other family to to be there to support you. And, you know, a couple other families is ideal. But uh, to be able to support you and, and uh, offer you, give you some child care when you really need a break. Hopefully this will help the parents in shifting their own mindset about what's important and what they need to do to help their child and not be focused on what do they need to do to get them through the school system. Absolutely. Sounds good, David. All right. Well, do you want to uh, give us any, uh, uh, any advanced previews on what this new book might be about? It's, it's really just going to be talking about the stuff I've always talked about, you know, looking at children differently, focusing on their emotions first, looking at the different learning styles, you know, understanding that stressed out children can't learn effectively and how to be a mindful teacher and, and how to relate to these children in a way that you literally become a rock star. And, and not only are you a rock star amongst all the kids, who's the most, which is the most important, but you're a rock star amongst all the teachers because no one else is going to know how to relate to these kids the way that you do. And because you know how to relate to them, you can educate the hardest of the heart. And, and you know, in so many ways, it's about not only uh, learning how to make kids feel better, but it's how, it's how to feel better as, as an educator. And it's how, how parents can communicate with, with their teachers and create a team that's really effective based on an understanding that works, that's been being implemented for years now. And, you know, it's going to benefit everyone. So, you know, the bottom line is how to bring more love in the classroom as opposed to fear. 
Yeah, how how wonderful would that be? You know, I remember listening to a talk that you were doing an uh, interview in some show, and, and the interviewer said something about, well, what if the kid starts throwing food? <clears throat> and, like, I, I could tell from her perspective, like, it was this fear about if one kid starts throwing food, they're all going to throw food, and what are we going to do to put a stop to this, and, and how should we discipline and punish these kids, and what should we do? And she was, like, uh, sort of all up in arms about it. And I remember your response was like, oh, hey, that's easy. You just go over and stand next to little Bobby and, uh, or Bobby, and you put your hand on his shoulder, and you say, you doing okay, bud? And you just stand there and things will calm down. And I thought that was an amazingly sort of so true and so commonsensical that it just defies the imagination to think that we don't have to go in there with a club and start hitting these kids in order to uh, teach them to calm down, which is really what we're trying to teach them. Well, and, and the key to that, David, is we have to be able to calm down first. You know, we have to realize that a kid throwing food is not the end of the world. No one's going to die. And if you're a really good teacher and none of the other teachers are looking, throw a donut or a roll and hit that kid in the forehead and everyone else is going to join in. You're going to have a good old food fight and it's going to be a sticky mess and everyone's going to have fun and then you all clean it up and then it's done and everyone realizes that you're a really cool teacher and you're not a threat. And the next time it starts to happen, you just say, no, nah, we're not going to have a food fight today, guys. And then the kid, because he realizes you're not a threat, you know, he stops throwing food. And, and, and then you just move on. You know, there's so many different solutions, so many different interventions, so many different ways to prevent things. If we can just step outside of our, our own levels of fear and overwhelm about what we think is going to happen if we don't do something. Yeah, amen to that. Well, we look forward right. to that. To that book in the future there, Brian. You bet. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we will uh, we'll probably do these talks every once in a while where we get a series of questions that might be uh, on a similar topic and try to present some of this and then let the, let the people know these will be available on Facebook and on our blog. And we'll be putting them on our website for parents to access uh, at times whenever they need to. So Sounds thank good. you very All much. So long as you don't mind me cooking my lunch. No, that'll be fine. <laughs>